Joseph Conrad, an introduction. Born in 1857 in Poland, Joseph Conrad became a British citizen just before he turned 30. In the intervening years, he lost both parents. As an orphan aged 11, he was therefore raised by an uncle who at 16 let the boy go to Marseille to work on merchant ships, where the colourful life of the sea was further enhanced by stints, gun-running and, intriguingly, political conspiracy. At age 36, his life turned from one of ships to one of literary pursuit. In doing so, Conrad brought to English literature a further layer of style and a deeper examination of the human psyche in a wealth of work. He wrote many novels, rightly regarded today as some of the finest in English literature. Among their canon are Lord Jim, Nostromo, The Shadow Line and, of course, Heart of Darkness. For this volume, we dwell among his numerous short stories. In these condensed narrative structures, much is said in beautiful language. His characters may be brave, comic, serious, trapped by their own constraints, or, as in The Brute, the ship itself, but are always fully formed and true to his words. These stories are read for you by Richard Mitchley. The Informer by Joseph Conrad Mr X came to me, preceded by a letter of introduction from a good friend of mine in Paris, specifically to see my collection of Chinese bronzes and porcelain. My friend in Paris is a collector too. He collects neither porcelain nor bronzes, nor pictures, nor medals, nor stamps, nor anything that could be profitably dispersed under an auctioneer's hammer. He would reject with genuine surprise the name of a collector, Nevertheless, that's what he is by temperament. He collects acquaintances. It is delicate work. He brings to it the patience, the passion, the determination of a true collector of curiosities. His collection does not contain any royal personages. I don't think he considers them sufficiently rare and interesting. But with that exception, he has met with and talked to everyone worth knowing on any conceivable ground. He observes them listens to them, penetrates them, measures them, and puts the memory away in the galleries of his mind. He has schemed, plotted, and travelled all over Europe in order to add to his collection of distinguished personal acquaintances. As he is wealthy, well-connected, and unprejudiced, his collection is pretty complete, including objects, or should I say subjects, whose value is unappreciated by the vulgar and often unknown to popular fame. Of those specimens, my friend is naturally the most proud. He wrote to me of X. He is the greatest rebel, revolte, of modern times. The world knows him as a revolutionary writer whose savage irony has laid bare the rottenness of the most respectable institutions. He has scalped every venerated head and has mangled at the stake of his wit every received opinion and every recognised principle of conduct and policy. Who does not remember his flaming red revolutionary pamphlets? Their sudden swarmings used to overwhelm the powers of every continental police like a plague of crimson gadflies. But this extreme writer has been also the active inspirer of secret societies, the mysterious unknown number one of desperate conspiracies, suspected and unsuspected, matured or baffled. And the world at large has never had an inkling of that fact. This accounts for him going about amongst us to this day, a veteran of many subterranean campaigns, standing aside now, safe within his reputation of merely the greatest destructive publicist that ever lived. Thus wrote my friend, adding that Mr X was an enlightened connoisseur of bronzes and china, and asking me to show him my collection. X turned up in due course. My treasures are disposed in three large rooms without carpets and curtains. There is no other furniture than the etages and the glass cases whose contents shall be worth a fortune to my heirs. I allow no fires to be lighted for fear of accidents, and a fireproof door separates them from the rest of the house. It was a bitter cold day. We kept on our overcoats and hats. Middle-sized and spare, his eyes alert in a long Roman-nosed countenance, X walked on his neat little feet with short steps and looked at my collection intelligently. I hope I looked at him intelligently too. A snow-white moustache and imperial made his nut-brown complexion appear darker than it really was. 
in his fur coat and shiny tall hat, that terrible man looked fashionable. I believe he belonged to a noble family, and could have called himself Vicomte X de la Z if he chose. We talked nothing but bronzes and porcelain. He was remarkably appreciative. We parted on cordial terms. Where he was staying, I don't know. I imagine he must have been a lonely man. Anarchists, I suppose, have no families. Not, at any rate, as we understand that social relation. Organisation into families may answer to a need of human nature, but in the last instance it is based on law, and therefore must be something odious and impossible to an anarchist. But indeed, I don't understand anarchists. Does a man of that, of that persuasion still remain an anarchist when alone, quite alone, and going to bed, for instance? Does he lay his head on the pillow, pull his bedclothes over him, and go to sleep with the necessity of the chambardement général, as the French slang has it, of the general blow-up, always present to his mind? And if so, how can he? I'm sure that if such a faith, or such a fanaticism, once mastered my thoughts, I would never be able to compose myself sufficiently to sleep, or eat, or perform any of the routine acts of daily life. I would want no wife, no children, I could have no friends, it seems to me. And as to collecting bronzes or china, that, I should say, would be quite out of the question. But I don't know. All I know is that Mr X took his meals in a very good restaurant, which I frequented also. With his head uncovered, the silver topknot of his brushed-up hair completed the character of his physiognomy, all bony ridges and sunken hollows, clothed in a perfect impassiveness of expression. His meagre brown hands, emerging from large white cuffs, came and went, breaking bread, pouring wine, and so on, with quiet, mechanical precision. His head and body above the tablecloth had a rigid immobility. This firebrand, this great agitator, exhibited the least possible amount of warmth and animation. His voice was rasping, cold and monotonous in a low key. He could not be called a talkative personality. But with his detached, calm manner, he appeared as ready to keep the conversation going as to drop it at any moment. And his conversation was by no means commonplace. To me, I own, there was some excitement in talking quietly across a dinner table with a man whose venomous pen stab had sapped the vitality of at least one monarchy. That much was a matter of public knowledge, but I knew more. I knew of him, from my friend, as a certainty what the guardians of social order in Europe had at most only suspected or dimly guessed at. He had had what I may call his underground life. And as I sat, evening after evening, facing him at dinner, a curiosity in that direction would naturally arise in my mind. I am a quiet and peaceable product of civilization, and know no passion other than the passion for collecting things which are rare and must remain exquisite, even if approaching to the monstrous. Some Chinese bronzes are monstrously precious. And here, out of my friend's collection, here I had before me a kind of rare monster. It is true that this monster was polished, and in a sense even exquisite. His beautiful, unruffled manner was that. But then he was not of bronze. He was not even Chinese, which would have enabled one to contemplate him calmly across the gulf of racial difference. He was alive and European. He had the manner of good society, wore a coat and hat like mine, and had pretty near the same taste in cooking. It was too frightful to think of. One evening he remarked casually in the course of conversation, There's no amendment to be got out of mankind except by terror and violence. You can imagine the effect of such a phrase out of such a man's mouth upon a person like myself whose whole scheme of life had been based upon a suave and delicate discrimination of social and artistic values. Just imagine, upon me, to whom all sorts and forms of violence appeared as unreal as the giants, ogres and seven-headed hydras whose activities affect fantastically the course of legends and fairy tales. I seemed suddenly to hear above the festive bustle and clatter of the brilliant restaurant the mutter of a hungry and seditious multitude. I suppose I am impressionable and imaginative. I had a disturbing vision of darkness full of lean jaws and wild eyes amongst the hundred electric lights of the place. But somehow this vision made me angry too. The sight of that man, so calm, breaking bits of white bread, exasperated me. 
and I had the audacity to ask him how it was that the starving proletariat of Europe, to whom he had been preaching revolt and violence, had not been made indignant by his openly luxurious life. At all this, I said pointedly, with a glance round the room and at the bottle of champagne we generally shared between us at dinner. He remained unmoved. 